Hello, everyone. It's this is Susanna Brady. I am Vice President of America's Sales for Cobalt Digital, and I also have the role of Chairman for the Risk Risk Forum, the the marketing part of the the Risk Group. So, uh, I welcome everyone to the session. Thank you so much uh, for taking time uh, to to be here with us today. I will be starting with a quick introduction on our speaker today. Our speaker is Sergio. Amirata, Sergio, we can we can we can say his name anytime, many ways, because Sergio was born in Italy and he grew up in Venezuela and also in California. So we can say in Italian, Spanish, and in English, whatever, whichever way uh, you want to say it. So um, Sergio received his PhD in physics from the Ohio State University. He's the founder and chief scientist of the software company called SIP Radios. In 2016, Sergio was honored as one of the Studio Daily Top 50 creatives and innovators across the media industry. He developed and patented an error correcting protocol known as Dozer. And he received the 2018 Emmy Award for Technology and Engineering for Dozer and also received the Society of Broadcast Engineers Technology Award in 2014 for Dozer. Sergio is also the lead developer for Librist, our open source library for RIST for the reliable internet stream transport protocol. And he contributes to the VLC project. He's a member of the Video Services Forum and a very active and valuable contributor to the risk activity group, the engineering, the technical part of the, the risk uh, group. He is not busy at all these days. So we thank you very much for taking the time to share information about Liberist with us today, Sergio. And with that, I will leave you with our audience. Um, I just want to remind everyone there's the Q&A session uh, box there. So if you have any questions throughout, um, just type it in. We'll, I will be monitoring the Q&A box and I'll make sure I'll bring that to Sergio's attention. And also um, the presentation should last about 30 minutes. So if you don't get your question answers throughout the presentation, be sure that at the end of the 30 minutes, we will be um, doing um, the Q&A and we'll be addressing your questions. So. I will leave it with uh, Sergio and hopefully most attendees join us by now. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Susanna. All right, let's get started. Uh, the presentation today uh, is gonna be more a tutorial, a hands-on tutorial on how to use Librist from beginning to end, how to uh, install it, compile it, run it. And we'll be, run, we'll be uh, running two uh, individual tests. One of them is gonna be a side-by-side -side test where we're gonna send two streams, one without protection and a second one inside a risk tunnel and we'll compare them side by side. And the second test is gonna be multi-path test. It's gonna be one stream across two paths and we'll prove the redundancy model and the redundancy split functionality of the, of the Libris library. So we're gonna start uh, on the first one uh, let me show you a diagram before we go anywhere of what we have here. Uh, we have uh, the, the presentation machine, which I'm on. Uh, that's one of the machines involved in the demo. The other one is gonna be a virtual machine installed VMware, and it's gonna be a pretty vanilla uh, install of Ubuntu. It's a uh, fresh install. So we're gonna be, the, both machines have two network interfaces connected, and uh, one is connected directly to a switch, the second one is connected to a network emulation device that will let us fine tune uh, delay, corruption, packet loss, et cetera. And uh, we, uh, on the first demo, we're gonna be using FFmpeg on the virtual machine to create two streams. One of them here on red is gonna be sent directly uh, to my console. And uh, on my console, we're just gonna go ahead and play it with VLC uh, across the, the network emulation device. The second stream, uh, second instance of FFmpeg is going to create a second stream, which will go to the local adapter of the virtual machine. Uh, there, the Libris tools will pick it up, encapsulate it in a tunnel, and send it to my console, the presentation machine, where it's going to be de-encapsulated 
and uh, then played also in a second VLC instance. And that's the green path here. So the, the very first test is we need to go and set up the VM, freshly installed VM with the tools that we need uh, to run the demo. So it's gonna be an Ubuntu 20.04 and we're gonna have only the build tools installed and that's gonna be a starting point. Uh, so let's go ahead and log into that machine. I have a, a console here. It's four identical consoles from this machine. This machine, you'll see that it says 11834. I'm going to go ahead and log in to the remote Ubuntu machine now with SSH. Uh, and you can see that it has Ubuntu installed. Let me go ahead and not get ahead of myself and do the first step, perfect. So, let's go, confirming the installation, go to 2004. Next step is the installation of the main basic packages that are needed, the dependency packages, those are all documented in the GitHub of the library. It's pretty straightforward. There's just a small number of packages that we need to install. We go ahead and install them. It only takes 15 seconds. It's quite very lightweight, it's done. So we go to the next step and now we're gonna clone the library directly from the G public Git repo. And again, when doing this in the VM, I just search into it. So there it is, library is cloned. Next step, we're gonna go ahead and compile the library. Uh, we're gonna follow these instructions and copy and paste. All right, so the library is here. I'm gonna create a build folder, enter the build folder, run the meson command point it to the Librist folder and it creates what I need. And then I run Ninja to compile, no errors. And I'm gonna do sudo ninja install to install in, my, in that uh, operating system. So that's complete. Library is cloned, compiled and installed in the OS. All right, next step is we're gonna register the libraries. In case of Ubuntu, not all the distros are this way. We need to do an LD config after we compile and install, and then we can test the tools themselves. So let's do this step. So we're gonna do sudo LD config. And now I should be able to run resender. There it is, shows the help file. And I can also bring up the more complex URL help. So we're all set. Uh, an additional step uh, in this machine is the installation of FFmpeg. Uh, we already did that ahead of time. It was a valuable 40 seconds that we saved. I'm gonna do it here, just run the command and it's gonna tell us that it's already installed. In your case, you're probably gonna have to wait a minute until the FFmpeg installation is complete. Good, so we have everything we need on the VM. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and use the multiple consoles that I have to run the different commands that I need. Uh, one command is gonna be FFmpeg sending the stream straight to my uh, machine here. Another uh, terminal window is gonna be to send a, another copy of the stream to the local adapter on the VM. And a third one is gonna be the resender tool that picks up that uh, stream on the local adapter encapsulates it in risk and pushes it all the way to the local machine. So let's start out by setting that up. These are the commands, the two FFmpeg commands that are, we're gonna create a test pattern that's built into FFmpeg. That's gonna be our source. And you see the two commands here. Let's go ahead and, and set them up. All right, 
Here's the first one. Excellent. So I just started the first command that's going to stream directly to my machine. What I'm going to do to verify, I have a VLC here. It's already pre-configured to receive that data. There it is. This is my IP, uh, the, the IP of uh, uh, the data coming in. So we can see uh, the straight path, straight stream, no protection, just a standard UDP stream coming from DVM here being played by VLC. All right, next, I'm gonna go to another console. I'm gonna log into the virtual. Perfect. And I'm gonna run another FFmpeg to the local adapter. There's, there's the command. So the same, a copy of the same stream is now being sent to the local adapter on the remote virtual. The next step now I'm gonna uh, start a restender command that picks up that stream and pushes it in, inside a rest tunnel. All right, switch terminals again, log into the remote machine. Now that's my third terminal. And make sure that I'm not ahead of the, trans uh, the presentation. So the FFmpeg, let's bring the next step. I'm going to also showcase the use of our authentication, uh, EAP authentication on, on the library, on, on the tools. For that, I need to create a password file, very much like the password file that is used on uh, HD password, for example. And I'm going to run these commands to create the, the, the password file. And then I'm going to run the resender after that. Go ahead and copy and paste the commands needed for the password. So you, part of one of the tools is called the wrist um, SRP password. And that's the one I'm gonna run. There it is. I run the three lines, I run the three times and you can see now the part, what the file looks like is just a base 64 encoded string uh, of uh, the appropriate data. Now that I have this, the next step is to run the resender on the VM and then another one, the res receiver on my local uh, terminal. Let's go ahead and take care of that. Resender. Okay, resender is running now. Okay. And let's run the receiver. In this last terminal, I haven't logged in, so it's going to be running the risk receiver. Perfect. So now you see we have the logs going on. On uh, here, the screen on the lower left is the resender with the stats, the appropriate stat. On the right-hand side, there is receiver. And now I the re receiver is gonna de-encapsulate the MPEG transfer screen that we push through it. And I should be able to play it on the local adapter uh, right here. And there it is. So now I'm playing another copy of the same stream on this local adapter. Let's say that smaller so we can see them both side by side, right here. All right, there it is. So I have the one on top goes to a straight and the one on the bottom goes to a wrist tunnel. Uh, notice that because I'm using color bars, uh, packet loss and packet corruption, et cetera, is not very noticeable, at least not in the areas where the color bars are static. So for this test, you have to pay attention to this moving color bar area, the, you know, the, the stripe and the numbers themselves. Those are the ones that will be affected on the top direct video. And on the bottom, you'll see that it, it retains a perfect quality throughout. Now, in order for us to now simulate the packet loss, I'm gonna use uh, our network emulator, uh, which is right here. This is a tool that controls it. And you can see right now, when I turned on one stream, this is the bit rate, and then the other one 
uh, Bitrig Double. Uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and show you the uh, controls for this. We have a 17.5 milliseconds delay programmed in on each direction for a total of 30 millise 35 milliseconds round trip. And right now we have zero percent packet loss. So I'm gonna start increasing this and show you what happens. Let's start with a small amount, 1% you know, packet loss. Uh, in the case of this color bar, it's not very noticeable immediately because it's mostly static data, but you can see here some macro blocking and some issues and also the frames sometimes are not there. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna go directly to a much higher value uh, to demonstrate this. Let's go to 10%. go. All right, now it's very significant. You can see with 10% packet loss, the, the pattern is completely destroyed. The frames and the seconds coming in, they just freeze or, or display, you know, nonsense. If this was a full blown video, it would be totally unwatchable uh, with a direct link. But you can see down here that the, the risk protected screen, it, it's perfect. There's no packet loss, no macro blocking, no, uh, no issues of any kind. And we can confirm that by looking at the logs of both the sender and the receiver here on the lower right. In the receiver, there's some important information. It measures the quality of the link and it reports it. Uh, it should tell us here that the quality is about 80% and it tells you the number of, yeah, 90 85 to 90% because of the number of uh, lost packets. It tells you uh, the number of received, the number of uh, recovered, uh, how many are missing still, et cetera. So it gives you pretty detailed statistics. It measures uh, on real time, the RTT between the two points. Uh, here we can see average RTT is 37, 38 milliseconds. Very consistent with what we put in it, and it tells you the bid rate and everything else. So let, let's go even a, a bit higher. Right now we're at 10, we will, let's go to 20% packet loss, which is, uh, continuous packet loss in this case. I mean, this is a pretty severe malfunction. Uh, we can see the bid rate having its fluctuations when I make the changes, but overall, uh, you don't see a, an increase in the bid rates because the, the gaps in data are filled in very efficiently by the protocol. So you don't get a, a large overhead, not even when you have to recuperate uh, uh, missing, missing data. Again, with 20% packet loss, you can see uh, our stream is still perfect here on the bottom and the top one has uh, major issues. It would, be, it would be unwatchable at this point, like, in the, like you see the numbers and, and the color bars, there's nothing. All right, let's go one step further and this will be the end of this part of the demo. 30% packet loss. Anyway, you get the point. The library is uh, designed and tested uh, typically up to 50% packet loss on a single string, continuous packet loss. So obviously if you have burstable burst of packet loss higher than 50 it can recover as well. And we'll demonstrate that in the next test when we do our uh, multi-path demo. So let's go ahead and uh, put the packet loss back at zero and so that we can prepare the link for the next uh, part of the presentation, the next demo. You can see the, the, the direct video recover and our still going strong as if, if nothing had happened. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. We did the A-B testing demo. We opened the two VLCs, we did the full demonstration and we saw the risk versus non-risk uh, effects on packet loss. Uh, these are the common lines used. It's very well documented. There's a, a wiki that explains every parameter. So what else can the library do? We're gonna demonstrate multiple, we can multiplex multiple streams coming in into a single tunnel. We can do split or redundant path. Uh, we have advanced options for compression. We have another application called risk to risk where you can create a, a repeater, you know, risk, uh, for example, risk simple profile to main profile repeater. And we have an option for synchronized uh, streaming as well on a time mode uh, parameter. Here we're gonna demonstrate uh, the split mode and uh, redundancy basically. It's gonna be the next uh, demonstration. All right, so the, in this demo, 
uh, what we're going to do is uh, let me show you the diagram so that we're on the same page here. All right. So in this demo, we have one instance of FFM packet on the virtual machine going to the local adapter. From there, we're going to pick it up with the, the, the resender and we're going to send it in two paths one through the network emulator and a second one through a straight switch through two separate and independent networks. Then we're going to have a risk receiver uh, combine the two streams and we're going to play back the result. After we have all of this up and running, we're going to grab the network emulator and we're going to tell it to give us a 100% packet loss, which is basically just pulling the plug and we'll see how our output doesn't see any glitches whatsoever. All right. It's useful in the case of two ISPs when you want to send a stream from point A to point B that needs to be perfect regardless if one of the ISPs goes down. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, start a demo. We need to leave only the FFmpeg that has that, that's going to the local adapter. The other one we don't need. So let's go ahead and set that up. I'm going to kill this receiver. This is the recent the FFmpeg that was going to the directly. I'm going to of that one. This one is the FFmpeg that we have to the local adapter. So I'm going to leave that one running. Okay. And this one on this corner, which is the old sender. Now I'm going to use a new sender that has the split path. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, my resender now has a, a split path configuration, and now I'm going to start a risk receiver that will combine those together on my local console. Okay. Oh, wrong one. Let's go back to this one there. All right. So now again, I have a resender, a risk receiver configured differently for a dual path. On the upper right hand side is my source going to the local adapter and the upper left hand side right now is empty. I'm going to exit that virtual. I'm going to use that one to show just a bandwidth manager on my local adapter to show you that I have basically two interfaces, each of them with the same amount of data coming in. And then we'll see how one of those goes down. Now for my playback device, we have a uh, this one up here is useless because now there's no stream. And the one that we're interested is this one, the one that's coming through the risk tunnel. It's the same playback device. So we're pretty much ready. Uh, it's all set up. We have a stream, we have dual path, and we have a player on my local console. So the next step. Okay. Go ahead and do transparencies. We got the sender. We got the receiver, we did the full redundancy. You can also do load balance with different weight. Uh, in our case, we didn't. Okay, reset the command line. Okay, and we played, we opened the VLC as we can see there. All right, so now Put them all in context again and do the final important demo, which is here it is. Okay, so we have uh, the bandwidth is half because we have only stream, not two going through the network emulator. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and put absolutely total packet loss 100%. The link is down. Boom. Now you can see the bandwidth immediately went to zero going through the network emulator and you see some hiccups here in the, in the log, uh, you know, that notice that, but uh, it was a seamless transition, seamless recovery. Uh, you can see the playback didn't take a hit and the statistics show that there are no, there is no packet loss. Everything is 100% uh, recovered regardless that, you know, of the fact that we lost, you know, one of the two legs. So that, that's pretty much the, the conclusion of the second part of the demo is a split path uh, 
uh, with redundancy and we completely turned off one of the two paths and so that it, there was no effect on the video. All right, so summary, you see how easy it is uh, to compile the library in a fresh uh, machine, a fresh install on a VM, on a VMware or perhaps a cloud. Uh, you see how easy it is to uh, use the, the built-in tools as production tools to establish links uh, with the advanced feature. And you can take advantage of any of the advanced feature, whether it's authentication, encryption, uh, split path, uh, or load balance among multiple links, etc. cetera. So uh, thank you very much. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start the Q and A, the Q and A uh, section. Yes, so we have a few questions already. So let me ask the first, first question. Can the library be used for commercial purposes? And are there any legal restrictions or requirements uh, when it's used? Yes, the library can be used for any purpose. It's open source, but it's, uh, it has a BSD type two license. It's a very liberal license, even within the open source that lets you uh, use uh, everything for commercial purposes. You can include the library in your projects, you can modify it, and you're not obligated to contribute the changes back. They can be just private to your own uh, source code base. So yes, it's very, very, very uh, flexible in that regard. And there are, there are no fees, there are no patent, you know, no patent uh, uh, payments of any kind either. It's just you know, the standard protocol. Okay, so no, no legal restrictions at all. No legal restrictions whatsoever. Okay, we got a quick question regarding um, if this webinar video is going to be available later. And if yes, could you inform where? So yes, we're gonna have this um, webinar session available on, uh, on the RIST Forum YouTube channel and all the um, registrants um, of this webinar are going to receive a thank you note with the link to the YouTube channel, to the YouTube um, uh, presentation. So yes, this will be available to you in the next um, couple of days. I should say by Monday, um, it should be out. Um, another question, is anybody offering commercial support for this library? Correct. There is always open source uh, you know, support on the um, GitLab website. Uh, but if a company requires or, or wants to engage in commercial support, uh, CPRADIUS will offer uh, commercial support for the library and, implement and private implementations as well. Okay, thank you. Another question is, um, are the tools just demo applications or are the, they production quality tools? And can I use them instead of writing my own application? Uh, the answer is uh, yes to both. They, they, the tools themselves were written as uh, a way for, to demonstrate all the features of the, of the library itself. But at the same time, we wrote them in such a way that they can and are actually used by our own uh, products uh, for production deployment. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, we recommend that uh, you use the tools as a starting point. Uh, we you run them side by side with your products. And then eventually, if necessary, you can integrate the library directly into your applications. It could be also a transition. While you get the library integrated into your product, use the external tools to use the same thing. Okay. Um, does VLC 4.x can play directly the risk stream and recover lost packets? Yes, VLC 4.x will have a risk built in as one of the protocols. So you can actually receive a risk stream or send a, a risk stream. Absolutely. Okay. And is the library integrated in any other open source projects? Uh, the library itself uh, will be integrated into FFmpeg as well. We're in the process of uh, you know, uh, finalizing that integration. Okay, um, that those, th these are some great questions. Thank you. There's uh, more questions here. So what happens if we get stuck during our proprietary implementation or the integration of the library? And again, it's the same question as before. Is there paid support available or is it open source community? The sure. I mean, we have a, a Telegram group as far as open source. We have, uh, a, a, it's not a Slack, it's the, the, the other tool. 
we have set several places where you can ask for public support for you know, open source support voluntary basis. But if you get stuck, uh, the SIP radios will offer paid support for anybody. Okay, SIP radios. Okay. Right. And what about logs? Are they time stamped? Uh, what are the important data to monitor? Uh, the logs for, for sender and receivers, they all include timestamps that you can see here. The beginning of every log has a timestamp. And uh, we pretty much have uh, on the library itself, there's some, a few uh, parameters that are given uh, to you on the callbacks. And then we have an expanded set of logs uh, that come every second. The logs can be read directly by the application. And there's also an option in the library and in tools to send the log to a remote location or using the UDP protocol. So you, have a, you can have a central place collecting the data and, and uh, graphing it or, or monitoring the links themselves. Uh, pretty much uh, everything that is relevant and important is already being printed out here on its okay. side. Okay, great. Um, I'm checking here, are there any other questions? Does anyone? have any other questions uh, at this time? This is some really good questions. Thank you. And again, this uh, presentation will be made available in the next couple of days. You should receive an email um, from myself. I'm going to try to send the email just, just in case. Uh, if we send it from our database, uh, it might get stuck in your um, junk mail or something or as a spam. So I'll, I'll make sure. I send it uh, directly from my email address to make sure everyone receives it. Um, there's one more question here. Is the library CPU intensive? Uh, not at all. No, no, no. Actually, we can see here uh, the, the usage and it's quite light. Even, even if you do encryption, it's quite lightweight. Uh, we, we have uh, done some tests and even on our Raspberry Pi, you can do uh, you know 50 megabits per second of encrypted data going through. Okay, that sounds that sounds great. Yeah. Here, on a, uh, when I sort by CPU, I cannot even see here. The resender is one point seven CPU. Oh, there is really sorry, there is receiver in this case, under two percent of the CPU in this machine to receive that data. So, but basically neg negligible, yeah. really. Um, a, a, a question that we get all the time. We love this question. What makes RISC better than SRT? Well, the, the SRT protocol was built for file transfers and then they modified to try to make it work with uh, uh, you know, real-time transmissions. Uh, the RISC protocol was built and designed by the, uh, basically the industry experts, the several companies that had patent in the industry that have been uh, running their own proprietary protocols for many years. They got together and we put the best of all of our protocols into what's now the RISC standard. So it was built uh, precisely for this purpose, uh, interoperability, uh, recovery from packet loss, multipath. These are all uh, elements that were part of the original design, which were not present on the SRT. The SRT filled in the gap when that was needed. But now that we have this library, uh, it was built you know, with all of this in mind. And of course, interoperability, it's already several vendors that have implemented the, the spec. There's no. In the case of SRT, there's only one source code that everybody uses. In this case, every vendor can implement their own and they all talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, one question here is regarding um, uh, the risk profile. Are you, are you using risk profile one or two in this demo? Maybe he meant simple profile or main profile? Right. The in first profile? Right. Yeah, in this demo, I, uh, we run the main profile with encryption. The library supports uh, also simple profile. It's one of the parameters you pass, and then you can either send or receive a simple profile, and you can send or receive main profile as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a question that came here to all panelists. Uh, which Raspberry Pi did you implement on this? Uh, we tested on Raspberry Pi 4, the latest one. The latest. Okay, great. Um, and there's this question about commercial support for the library, which was already answered. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Any, wow, this is a fantastic question. Um, would anyone else have a question? Of course, uh, when I um, send you a thank you email with the link to the session, we're going to include Sergio's uh, email address. So you can feel free to contact Sergio directly and ask any 
other questions that come up later. And um, again, thank you very much for um, taking the time to be on this session. Thank you, Kira McCarty from Zixi for organizing this session. Thanks so much, Sergio. And um, checking here one more time if there are any other questions. I guess not, that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much everyone for today's session. And uh, we are gonna be offering a session almost every month. We have five other topics lined up and material ready for the upcoming webinars for RIST. So lots of uh, very interesting, unique um, uh, sessions that we're planning for, already have one planned for January and February. And so I think we're gonna be posting a calendar of these upcoming sessions on our website soon so everybody can see ahead you know what we're planning to do but there's lots of great contributors lots of uh, wonderful useful ideas so we'll be getting um, those out on our website um, very soon and thanks for thanks for you all who asked the questions everyone has have a wonderful day thank you so much <laughs>